The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, Jesus sent, they sent to Jesus some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to entrap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care for no man, and for you do not regard the position of men, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a coin and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were amazed at him. The Gospel of the Lord. God is good, and all the time. The Gospel passage that we have read today has got uh, three main points. It follows a certain pattern that is common in many meetings between Jesus and the Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, and the rest. Normally it goes like this. Uh, they come and approach Jesus. Uh, they praise him at times. They put a question to him. He challenges them, and then at the end, either they are either embarrassed, they are, I mean they are afraid, or they become even more angry and look for another opportunity again to set him up. The Pharisees and Herodians approach Jesus with what according to them is a question that whichever way he answers, he will either annoy the people or annoy the existing government. They even begin with flattery. To catch him in his words, they came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to what, who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked them. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought a coin. The society that we're talking about is a society that is guided by shame and honor. It's about shaming or honoring. By shaming, you bring down that person who looked great before. And most of the time in the Gospels, you'll see this theme playing a, a, a lot. They want to discredit Jesus. They put a question to him, but as usual, it gives him the opportunity to shine even more, to get more honor. I always wonder why they didn't ever learn that they were losing the battle, they were losing the, the, the fight all the time. Even when they put him on the cross, they put Jesus on the cross itself and killed him. As a final act to do away with him, didn't he resurrect even from the dead? Now you understand two things about scripture. It says in Matthew 10 verse 19, But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time you'll be given what to say. Remember again, we have just come from the Feast of Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit is active in our lives, just as I believe he was active in Jesus' life. Matthew chapter 9, verse 2 to 4 says, And behold, some brought him to a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your hearts? And Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. That is in Matthew chapter 16, verse 7 to 8. And it, they reasoned among themselves, is it because you have taken no bread? Jesus knows our thoughts. He told us that even when you go to pray, your father knows what you're going to say, even before it's on your lips. Jesus asked them for a coin, which is interesting because ordinarily he would have had a coin or somebody should have a coin. He didn't have a coin. And he asked them, whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. 
The image of Caesar on a coin had a lot of meaning. I'll pick out three. Number one, simply put, the one whose image is on the coin was the one in power. So if a nation was conquered and the new king took over, the fact that their coin will bear his image was a silent yet powerful message of who is in charge. Then secondly, the area which a coin was used as valid currency showed the extent of his power. And thirdly, as long as the inscription was his, it showed that it was his personal property. This last one I always think, even the money that you have, let's say it's a note, you cannot go out there in public and burn it or tear it. You'll be arrested. So see, now you know that it, is some, it belongs to somebody else, you are just a custodian of it for a short time. Jesus gives them an answer that they do not expect. Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Think about it. Caesar needs his taxes. We need a government and we need to fund its functions. Without the laws of the state, life would be chaos. The state is in charge of the provision of services, which makes life livable. But we have the honor, we have to honor our responsibilities as citizens of the state. But never forget at the end of the day that God is higher than the state. So as much as we have responsibilities to the state, we also have responsibilities to God. If there is an image of Caesar on a coin, now remember that Genesis 1 verse 26 and 27 says that we are created in the image and likeness of God. The image of God is imprinted on us as much as the image of Caesar is imprinted on a human coin. It's also true that both the state and man belong to God and are under God. Better still, if one is a true Christian, then most likely he is a good citizen. And the conclusion of the story, and they were amazed at him. I always love this ending. And they were amazed at him. As usual, they were defeated in their own game. Therefore, let us continue being loyal citizens to our country, but more so, let the image of God in our own lives be seen to be active, following the words of today's first reading from 2 Peter chapter 3. It says, we should be living holy and saintly lives. And then it says, think of the Lord's patience as an opportunity to be saved. And then lastly, continue growing in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory in time and eternity. Amen. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you again for the gift of your word. I want to thank you even for the questions that were asked to our Lord Jesus Christ. And that because of his answers, we know our responsibility. We know our responsibility to you, O oh Father, and we also know our responsibility to the state. And may you guide the state, especially during this coronavirus pandemic, uh, to make the best decisions that are suitable for its citizens. We also pray that even as we continue observing all this, even though the churches may be closed, we we may never forget you, God, because you are greater than the state. You are greater than this pandemic. You are greater than everything else. Your name ranks above every other name. Lord, we pray again that you may continue helping us and blessing us, both with your word, your, your sacraments, and even with your grace, that through this we may be able, in the words of St. Paul, in the words of Peter, and the words of the apostles and the prophets, to live holy and saintly lives. And may Almighty God bless us all in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.